It is my great pleasure to, to, to introduce an exemplar of everything Heidi was talking about. Sarah Brown is the CEO of Purple House, which is a charity that she set up that, which helps Indigenous people basically get a number of fa functions, but health functions. She has three children who are all succeeding in their own right and taller than her. And uh, she d loves driving around in her Morris Minor, which matches my HD Holden, as we discover. <laughs> She was Australia's Hester Nurse of the Year. So if you're looking for awards and accolades, that is a very serious and important award. And she has been an academic, but now she is uh, a practitioner and is here to t tell us about her wonderful charity, Purple House. Thanks everyone so much for having me today. Um, this is I'll do a different version of the talk that I did at 7 o'clock this morning. <laughs> I've warmed up a bit since then. <clears throat> so our official name <clears throat> is Western Desert Ngunnawalcha Palinjaku Jutiku Aboriginal Corporation, which is why people call us the Purple House. And if you know anything about Aboriginal art, then um, you'll know that our logo, which we made a long time ago, is people coming in from different communities to sit down and meet. And the little horseshoe shapes um, are the shape that your bum makes when you've been sitting in the sand and you s stand up. So lots of little brown bums, and I guess I'm one of these, those two little white bums. I should have said it, that I, usually when I start, I do a swearing alert. It might get a bit rougher than bum, but not too rough. Um, so that's us and our story, <laughs> our story um, starts out in Kintor which is about seven hours drive west of Alice Springs and um, people out there had, so, so our mob talk about in the naked times that they used to travel through this country in little family groups as hunters and gatherers. And the blokes had kang killed kangaroos and the women provided most of the food and did most of the work by digging for witchetty grubs, catching lizards, grinding up seeds from the grasses to make flour and then damper. But white fellas came fairly late to this country. It wasn't until the 1950s that they started. They were obsessed with chasing people around wanting them to sit down in one place and put trousers on. Um, so, so people got moved off the country and put, they were living in um, a community called Papanya, which is where people started to paint. Um, and it was a big mission. So our mob still tell stories of um, queuing up for supplies of sugar, flour, tea and tobacco in Papanya. They were desperate to go home. So they lobbied and fought to get back out to their country, got home to Kintor in 1981, which I don't know about you, but that feels like yesterday, um, and were really happy to be back on their community, painting for their art centre, doing their own thing. And in the 1990s, people started to get a diagnosis of kidney disease and were told that they couldn't stay on their country anymore that they'd have to move to Alice Springs for dialysis three times a week for the rest of their lives. So some people were doing that, but were really miserable. Um, and this is actually a photo of Mavis, who it went to the UN, and she's saying, I'm a prisoner to my dialysis machine. It's taking me away from my family and my country and everything that's precious to me. So they said, well, the only reason why people are leaving their country is to be close to a machine. So why can't we have a machine in Kintor and then we can look after people ourselves? At the time, so this is what they wanted. This is Patrick doing dialysis out on country with his favourite grandson in his lap. Um, so they went and asked politicians for some help to get a dialysis machine in Kintor and they were told to bugger off, basically. At the time, there was only dialysis in Alice Springs and Darwin and nothing anywhere else. And so what they did was they got together and they painted some pictures. 
And this was the Kintore women. And their painting sold for $170,000. And the Kirikura men, so talking about wage parity, the, this gorgeous painting made $170,000. This bloke's painting made $340,000. <laughs> Kerry, Kerry, we were very thankful at the time, and Kerry Stokes, who owned Channel 7, bought this painting. Apparently, it's on his lounge room wall. So what they did was they had an auction at the Art Gallery of New South Wales, and they raised a million dollars in one night. Unfortunately, we spent it all now, but it did last for some years. So they got together and formed a kidney committee who were family for dialysis patients and they started to make plans to try and get a dialysis machine on country. Had never been done before. Um, and it took us until 2005 before we got dialysis out bush for a variety of reasons. But what it meant was that this old lady, Ningara Naparula, she got to spend the last five years of her life out on country, doing her own thing, painting for her art centre. And when she, part, when she couldn't have dialysis anymore, everyone rallied around to give her a really good time and she died with a belly full of lizard, which is a good <laughs> pin to be way to go. And this is her painting in Paris. So this is the Indigenous Art Museum in Paris. <clears throat> and this is her painting. So we started to get people home to Kintore and lo and behold, they started to be healthier and living longer and were living in their own houses and not needing interpreters and social workers and painting for their art centres. So word spread across the Bush Telegraph and we got lots of other requests from other communities to help. Um, this was um, Morris Gibson, who died last year, but he actually had 10 years home on country on dialysis. And um, he actually lost both his legs, but it didn't stop him. He had, this is his painting on the back of the truck, and he had a scooter, always had a scooter on the go. And um, he, he was a bush mechanic for this scooter. So one day I got a, a phone call from one of the nurses, well, from him actually, and he said, hey, Napple Jarry, that's me, you, you need to send me some more T-shirts. I was like, Morris, you've got lots of T-shirts. What's going on? He said, no, I had a flat tyre on my little car and it takes five T-shirts to fix a tyre. <laughs> and I said, Morris, what are you doing? He said... Relax, it takes five blankets to fix a troopy tyre. <laughs> and an, another day when um, the nurse rang and said, I think we better start saving for a new scooter for Morris. And she sent me a photo and the electrics had broken and he couldn't find a piece of wire to complete the circuit. So instead he'd found a mouse <laughs> and he'd wired a mouse in from one leg to the other leg <laughs> to complete the circuit. Um, so we realised we weren't going to... Some of the communities that people need to get home to are tiny. 70 people, 150 dogs. Um, and so we knew that we weren't going to have dialysis in every community where people needed to get home to. So we thought, why not build a truck with dialysis in the back? Um, so I now know more about truck engineering than I ever learned at nursing school. And, um, and we built this truck. It's been on the road for seven years and it can basically go anywhere we can find a tap to fill up the water tanks. And then we actually helped the South Australian government to design their truck and they made a truck for South Australian communities a couple of years ago. But this was the first. When you got the purple truck heading into town, coming to a community where people have never got home, it's a great opportunity to talk to people about how to keep their kidneys healthy. And this is a school trip to the purple truck out in Kirikura, which is officially Australia's remotest community. We've got dialysis all the time there now, but at the time we were getting the truck out there for periods of time. Um, our rotary story started, I think it's about 12 years ago now, where there was this fixer-upper in the middle of Kintore 
um, that had been an abandoned building for years. And I used to wander around it dreaming about what a fabulous thing it could be because I've got a good imagination. And it had a camel living in the kitchen. <laughs> so via a long story of connections, which is often a rotary story, um, Woden Rotary took this on as a project and it became an international rotary project with help from South Korea. And over two years, they sent out 10 work crews to Kintor, which is a bloody long way away, to help us. We worked out that the average age of participants, rotary participants on this project was 73. And sometimes they went all the way out to Kintor and had forgotten to take their tablets. <laughs> we soon started to remind them. Um, and what we ended up was, we, was a four-chair dialysis unit, a community kitchen meeting area and a three-bedroom nurse's house all in the same building. So you can't really see it there, but you can see it turned purple and it had fencing and, sh and sheds and that was celebrating 10 years of dialysis out there a few years ago now. Um, this is doing dialysis in the back of the truck and little Janie Nakamara there is Morris Minor size. She's this big. Um, with one of our dialysis nurses, Alinta. Look at the work and health, work, health and safety on this. <laughs> so the Rotarians got a, a taste for purple paint and um, decided to keep helping us. So this was further out in Kirikura, converting an old clinic into a nurse's house. That trip, I chucked my 15-year-old son out to give them a hand to do the climbing through the roof stuff. Um, gave him a week off school and he came back and decided to become an electrician. So he's in his second year of his apprenticeship in Adelaide now. So if anyone's booking in for solar panels <laughs> and you have a young fella on your roof called Paddy, ask him if he knows anything about the Purple House. <laughs> and there's the Rotary Club that helped us to do a similar thing in Wannan in Western Australia. So. This is our geographical spread now. Afternoon snoozes are well and truly over, except perhaps for this afternoon. <laughs> and we're from Yukala in Arnhem Land, and we've actually, I need to update this because we're on Groot Island as well. So we've got a couple of seaside sites to offer our nurses, and we're right down to Warburton in WA. And this year we're building in Ernabella, which will be our first South Australian dialysis unit which I'll tell you more about in a minute. I have to watch the time too, because I've been told I'll get <laughs> off. Uh, this is Yundamu, our dialysis unit there, um, in Lajamanu. So uh, my bosses are Aboriginal people from the communities, and they're incredibly proud of what they've achieved. And that's a big part of the ripple effects of this project. So it's Lajamanu. And this is the Purple House in Alice. So we've got a little house in, just in the suburbs in Alice Springs. And it's the only dialysis centre where people come and hang out with you on their non-dialysis days. <laughs> I am chief toenail cutter and chin plucker. <laughs> I'm wondering who's going to do it for me when I'm a bit older. Um, we've got chickens, we've got a pizza oven, we've got a karaoke machine. We have old American tourists who come to visit the Purple House. Um, I'll tell you the old American tourist story in a minute because um, you'll see, well, actually, I should tell it now because you'll see on the mural, which was done by grandkids. Can you see this? It's a kangaroo tail. Yep. So, so, we have, so we have lots of stuff going on. We've got dialysis and GP clinics. We've got no tea. We've got all sorts of things happening, one-stop shop. And we make bush medicine and we cook kangaroo tails on the fire and we do all sorts of things. And in the afternoons, a bus pulls up and six... Are there any old Americans in the audience? <laughs> <laughs> and 16 old American tourists turn up and they pay $10 a head to come and see the Purple House, meet a real Aboriginal person <laughs> and um, to see what we're doing. So it was $10,000 last year. That's a lot of old American tourists. <laughs> so sometimes when, when they come, we're cooking kangaroo tails. 
And the old ladies who are sitting around the fire, cooking the tails, making the damper, having a sing, will invite them over to have a look. And this one day, this lady goes, how long do they take to grow back? <laughs> <laughs> and the, the first time this happened, I said, no, I'm really sorry, they don't grow back. And she said, well, don't they all fall over? <laughs> And I'm like, no, actually people eat the whole kangaroo. This is just like the party food. And they started to squeal with horror and kind of there were a couple of people kind of vomiting in the back of their throats. <laughs> so now if I get that question, I just say two to three weeks. <laughs> I, I've, I've worked out, I do get that question about two-thirds of the time. So... There are hundreds of American tourists who've gone back to the US of A telling people that kangaroo tails grow back like lizards. <laughs> the other really funny old American tourist story the other day was um, Sam, who's one of the patients, had finished on dialysis, he was eating his lunch, and he whispered to me, are they Americans? And this woman heard and she said, yes, we're from the United States of America. And he looked up at her and he said, I've been worrying for you, mob. <laughs> and she, she looked like she couldn't, does not compute. And she said, why would you be worrying about us? And he said, that man, that man with the orange hair, <laughs> that Trump, he said, he says he's going to build a wall to keep their Mexicans out. And you, Mob, you're going to get so lonely. <laughs> so these are our chickens. This is Elsa Nova Nupanunka. Elsa, named from Frozen. Nova, after Nova Paris, the Aboriginal politician Olympi Olympian. Nova came to visit her chicken. She wanted that photo for Facebook. Nova is not a chicken person. I got Elsa Nova and I handed her over to Nova, who had her assistant ready to take the photo. The chook sensed the anxiety and squawked. <laughs> Nova squeezed and green wet went whoosh, all down her legs and Nova screamed her head off. She resigned from politics a couple of weeks later, but I don't think it was down to us. Now, one of the things that people really missed from their time out bush was access to bush medicines. And um, so they would start, they'd get, they'd get some, somebody to go and pick some of the plants and send them into town and they'd sit in the garden and grind them up and make a bu batch of bush medicine. Um, it, traditionally, it would have been boiled up with animal fat, but we use olive oil and beeswax much nicer. We did actually make once make a batch of camel hump soap and it's and and the camel hump is like all fat so you had to saw it up with a saw and boil it up on the fire and it smelt like camel. We decided life was too short for that. Made beautiful soap but I was like marketing opportunity um, hump for dialysis <laughs> or Rub your rump with a hump for dialysis. <laughs> Not sure it was going to work. But anyway, people were hunters and gatherers, so they weren't going to um, waste their time on things that didn't work. So the patients would make a batch in these little plastic tubs and then they'd go and deliver it to each other around town. And we realised that this was an opportunity for a social enterprise. So um, we're now Oxfam traders. We've got an online shop. Um, we do com conferences and that sort of thing and we, you can see our stuff in Oxfam and in the art gallery and the museum here in the gift shops. But that's, we, it's also given us an opportunity. It's employment for dialysis patients. Gives them an opportunity to pass the knowledge about the plants on. Great one for arthritis, another one that's really good for psoriasis and eczema. Um, but we've also had... 14, 15 young Indigenous trainees come through and study and learn with us and work on the project. So it's a bit of a beautiful thing. Now, a couple of months ago, I'd been hassling Midnight Oil. You know, they just did an Australian tour and they started it in Alice Springs. So I'd been hassling them 
about coming for a visit and I heard nothing. And I was swearing about midnight or forgetting their past roots and, you know, beds are burning from Yundamu and Kintor and all that's in the song. And I turned up to work one day and our Maori bush bookkeeper, who's not into popular Australian culture, let alone rock bands of the 1980s, said, oh, there's been a phone call from a mining company called Midnight Oil. <laughs> They're, they're dropping in this morning to visit and give you some money. I was like, when? <laughs> so, oh, I don't know, about 20 minutes. <laughs> so you can see Peter Garrett up the back and this is a collection of patients and volunteers and staff at the Purple House being very happy to see a big bald man come and drop <laughs> off a cheque for $10,000. We still raise money ourselves through... This was an exhibition of Dialysis Patients Works. Um, the, we've got a piggy bank in the Purple House and the patients actually put all their money in the piggy bank and raid their grandkids' piggy banks. <laughs> and this is um, Monica offering you a lizard if you ever come out to um, Kintor. The, the ochre is... She's in sorry camp, so that's one of the ways you know she's lost someone. Now, years ago, an old fella called Kenyon McKenzie, who was a bloke from Ernabella, um, came to the Purple House looking for a place in Alice Springs where he could boil up a chicken in his billy because he was stuck in Alice Springs for dialysis. And, of course, we said, of course you can come. And then we looked at his chicken and it was green, so we chucked <laughs> that out and got him a new chicken. And he asked the Purple House to help to get dialysis in Ernabella. So Pukacha is its other name in the APY lands. And an opportunity came up a few years ago for us to get some Commonwealth money. So we've got a $1.5 million building fund to build a four-chair dialysis unit and two nurses, wage, nurses houses in Annabella. Um, South Australian government said they'd help us out if we, first th we raised the first year's operational funding ourselves. Um, and one of the things, lovely things that happened out of that was all the art centres in the APY lands donated works for us and we had an auction at um, Tandanya in Tanandi, the big Aboriginal art festival in October last year. So this was the painting that the grandmas and their granddaughters from Armata painted, specifically a story about getting people home to country. And this was the auction and we raised... So um, Rotarians came and helped sit the exhibition for the weekend so no one carried the paintings out in their handbags, though they'd have to have had very big handbags. <laughs> and we raised $169,000 in the afternoon and there wasn't a dry eye in the house. This gorgeous woman from Ernabella got up and she said, I've, I've been waiting and waiting and missing my family in Adelaide. And, but then I heard, I heard some good news. So now I'm going to roll my swag and I'm heading home for Ernabella. And everyone cheered. Um, oh, and so um, the other lovely thing that's happened with this is that Rotary Clubs in Adelaide have banded together. And um, if you know Jerry Casburn from Unley, um, I, get, I get you all mixed up. Um, <laughs> Then it's an international rotary project and they're teaming up with um, Kansas Rotary Clubs um, and they're going to try and raise the money for the dialysis machines and the medical equipment and the furniture and hopefully come up when we're setting it all up. So if anyone's interested in being... In, that's a live project at the moment. Um, I've run out of time, but I just needed to show you this because I got a phone call from an Aboriginal corporation in Alice Springs to say, um, we've met and we want to help you out and you need to come to the Araluan Art Centre and choose an Albert Namajira painting off the wall. So this is what I chose and then we flogged it off for $95,000. So I chose well. <laughs> and I just... we. we just before Christmas, we opened three new dialysis units. And if you're on Facebook, the Purple House Facebook page, we have lots of lovely stories like this. The fella on the right, who's wheelie walkers on the bank, had been stuck in town for years and years. He was desperate to go home. And this is 
our nurse taking all the dialysis patients in Docker River um, out for a swim after dialysis. And um, just Neil's smile says it all, really. Uh, we won the Indigenous Governance Awards for Australia in 2016, which was a lovely thing to do. Um, we're all about keeping people, sucking the life, sucking the juice out of every day and helping people to have an opportunity to be on country and teach their grandkids and look after their country. Um, and so this is Fenia who works for, has worked at the Purple House for the last 10 years and Helen. Um, so it's a pretty special place. So thank you so much for, for inviting me here today. And um, yeah, we, we're easy to contact if any. We love crazy ideas and we love visitors to Alice Springs to come and have a cup of tea and a tail or maybe yeah. even a witchetty grub. <laughs> Thank you. Sarah? What an inspiring speech. Now, are there anybody got any questions? Okay. Shall I start again? Anyway, <laughs> um, the amount of dialysis required is mind-boggling to me and I wonder how much um, you put into prevention through diet or lifestyle or whatever the cause might be. Is it genetic or both or what okay. with Aboriginal people and, you know, wonderful stuff. Thank yeah, you. No worries. Um, so 1985, people walked in to Kirikura having never seen white people, still naked. Um, the only way for, for hunters and gatherers to survive on country was to be really good at storing. So they've gone from being really good at storing, because you might only eat once a week, to sitting next to a shop full of meat pies and, and co bloody Coca-Cola. Um, so there's a mixture. So people say it's about being born prematurely. So anything you can do with young women and um, building up young women and encouraging them to wait for a bit longer before they have their first baby will help in the long term. Childhood infections, diabetes, high bl blood pressure are all the white fellow... For Aboriginal people, it's about the spirit. It's about being on country with family, doing things the right way. Um, so, yeah, we've got to do this. <laughs> I'm very good at doing this these days. <laughs> Um, so we're, we're trying to help people make healthy choices, easier choices on communities, encourage people to go to the clinic to get infections treated. Um, but also, and the numbers of people requiring dialysis are still rising, but partly that is because 15 years ago everyone was dying of heart attacks. That the fact that people are on dialysis is actually a good sign because it means they're living long enough to be on dialysis. We'll get on top of dialysis, we'll turn all our dialysis centres into well-being party houses and probably the next wave will be cancer. And that's just the reality that, you know, people are desperately trying to catch up. But a really important part of this project is that people had a problem, they came up with their own solution and they saw it work. So that gives people agency over their lives, which is so important. So many government policies over the last year particularly the last 15 years, have been about taking away control and treating people like children. And it's really important that projects like this are successful because people have managed to do something for themselves. Thank you. I'll catch you later. Yes. Yes. So anyone else can catch Sarah Lace on behalf of the Rotary Club of Adelaide? Thank, thank you. Thanks.